This video was made possible by a free story productions. From independence in August 1960 to December 1993, Felix Hufwebony governed the Cote d'Ivoire as a benign autocrat who used the firm hand, developing a unique form of government, which, despite its many faults, made the country one of the most stable and peaceful in Africa. Bonny is a man who divides opinion even in his death. He made history, although he did not make it into history, at least not as gloriously as in Kwame Nkrumah, Nyerere, Sekuture, or Patrice Lumumba. He is generally overlooked and dismissed as a lucky and a sellout of the French, due to his cousins to the former colonial masters. In this episode, we look at the life of Félix Oufoué Bonny and his 33-year rule of Côte d'Ivoire. Félix Houfoué was born on the 18th of October 1905 in the village of Yamasukro in the southern part of Côte d'Ivoire. His father was a Baure tribal chief and a wealthy cocoa farmer. At five years old, he inherited vast amounts of land and cocoa plantations from his maternal uncle. He attended primary and secondary school in his village and graduated as a medical assistant in Dhaka, Senegal. Using his family's prosperous plantation, he rose to political prominence by organizing the Syndicate Agricole Africaine, SAA, a union that defended farm workers and labor interests. In November 1945, he was elected with a narrow margin in the second ballot as Côte d'Ivoire's delegate to the French Constituent Assembly, despite the colonial administration imposing a candidate more favorable to their rule. After the victory, he added the name Bonny to his surname, meaning irresistible force in Baole, and symbolizing his role as a leader. The following April, he enacted legislation that abolished all forms of forced labor in overseas France. He held various ministerial positions within the French government, thanks to the assimilation policy, which was his source of grooming in protecting French interests. Using his political prowess with the SAA, Houfoué Bonny started Côte d'Ivoire's first independent political party called Democratic Party of Ivory Coast, PDCI, which became part of a larger network of French-speaking West African pre-independence political parties, known as the African Democratic Lari, RDA. At the time when most African countries were decolonizing, led by Ghana and Nkwame Nkrumah, Bonny placed himself in stark opposition to his neighbor and rival refusing to even attend independence celebrations in Ghana on the invitation of Nkrumah. Disagreements arose when Nkrumah preached political independence as a precondition to economic independence. However, Bonny believed that political independence without economic independence was worthless, making him a champion of anti-independence at the time. This guided his policies of relying entirely on France in order to achieve his ambitions. A rare symbolic encounter that came to be known as the wager happened between the two key figures when they met in April 1957 in Abidjan. At the meeting, Ghana was already independent, but Cote d'Ivoire had voted for a gradual process of decolonization from France within a framework of a French-speaking West Africa. While at the conference, Kwame Nkrumah called on all colonies in Africa to declare their independence. Bonny hit back to Nkrumah saying, quote, Your experience is rather impressive but it would perhaps be more interesting to try a new and different experience than yours and unique in itself, one of a Francophone African community based on equality and fraternity. Bonny concluded saying, quote, So let us meet up again in 10 years to see who among us has chosen the best approach for his people. The wager incident will be covered in our later episodes in depth and why it is so crucial for post-colonial Africa. On the 28th of September 1958, Charles de Gaulle, the then president of France, proposed a constitutional referendum to the Franco-African community. He presented the territories with two choices, to either support the constitution or proclaim independence and be cut off from France. Bonny never hesitated in his decision. He voted in favor of the constitution to become an autonomous republic within the French community. Guinea under Ahmed Sekoutouré was the only territory to vote no and was given immediate independence. Sekoutouré called out Houfoué Bonny stating that his preference was, quote, freedom in poverty over wealth in slavery. However, de Gaulle's decision to grant independence to the Mali Federation that consisted of French Sudan, Senegal, Upper Volta and Dahomey angered Houfoué that he later demanded independence for the Ivory Coast too. 
So on the 7th of August 1960, Ivory Coast became independent, and in November, Ufwe Bonyi was elected as its first president. Bonyi faced no opposition from rival parties. The opposition only came from within his own government. However, these were also mercilessly suppressed through arrests and torture. When radical nationalists led by John Baptiste Moke openly opposed the government's francophile policies, Bonny exiled Moke in September 1959, claiming that Moke had attempted to assassinate him, using voodoo in what Bonny called the Black Cat Conspiracy. However, a few years later, in a gesture of reconciliation, all the dissidents were released apart from Ernest Boka, who died because of injuries inflicted by guards during his torture. With no opposition, Bonny was free to form a society based on realistic capitalism and a system of economic liberalism. With agricultural interests high on his list of priorities, he traveled to Israel to learn about suitable crops and planting methods. From 1960 to 1989, cocoa production registered a tenfold increase from 80,000 to nearly 800,000 tons, and coffee output doubled to 300,000 tons placing Cote d'Ivoire among the world's top producers. The list of profitable exports also included pineapples and other tropical fruits, timber, sugarcane, rubber, palm oil, and rice. Foreign investors locally produced and processed all these products. He established investment laws in 1959 to attract French and other investors. The laws allowed foreign investors to repatriate up to 90% of their profits in their country of origin. The remaining 10% was to be reinvested in Côte d'Ivoire. The law also included low tariffs on raw materials and machinery that was imported into the country. Bonny perceived a very liberal immigration policy. He cautiously took in non-Ivorians from the Francophone West African countries and would not allow any form of discrimination against them. The government also welcomed Fulube pastorists and set up programs to increase cattle productivity. He further encouraged the pastoralists to settle in the northern parts of the country while the Ghanaian authorities were hostile to them. As a result, many immigrants held high and very sensitive political offices that seemed to consolidate their emergent claim to the citizenship in the country. Côte d'Ivoire also became the hub of economic activities in the region, attracting both the best in human capital and a pool of unskilled labor from its immediate neighbors. Both Ivorians and foreigners began showering Bonny with praises and titles calling him the Sage of Africa for performing what came to be known as the Ivorian Miracle. He developed an agenda for modernizing the country's infrastructure by building an American-style business district in Abidjan, where five-star hotels and resorts welcomed tourists and businessmen. Côte d'Ivoire experienced economic growth of 11 to 12 percent from 1960 to 1965. The country's GDP grew 12 times between 1960 and 1978, while the trade balance continued to a record surplus. Bonnier's Côte d'Ivoire was highly a diverse state, containing over 60 different ethnic groups. The varied nature of this population made peace and leadership difficult. He achieved peace and unity in his country through two means. First, he redistributed the wealth away from ethnic groups that were traditionally rich to those that were poor. He also worked to maintain through sharing and redistributing power among ethnic groups. In doing so, he avoided the build-up of tensions within the nation. Through these actions, Hufwe Bonyi was able to create a government that most people supported. As a man of peace and political visionary, he somewhat favored negotiation. Felix Ufwe Bonyi foresaw the dismantling of apartheid in South Africa. At one time he said, it is a mistake to think that there is no choice but war to get rid of apartheid. In any case, one day, whether it comes before war or after war, dialogue will be necessary. In order to prevent battle, it is infinitely better to engage in negotiation as early as possible. He also advocated for dialogue between the Arabs and Israels in July 1962. In 1960, he proposed a meeting of French African leaders to help end the Algerian war. However, the portrayal of Ufufwe Bonyi as a man of peace by the West was selective, especially in his foreign policy. His attitude bothered many African leaders, notably of all Nkwame Nkrumah and Sekou who accused him of continuously advancing new imperialism. Bonyi responded by organizing opposition against the expansionist dream of Ghana and Guinea. He helped to deny Nkrumah a much-needed triumph during the 1965 OAU meeting in Accra. 
At the conference, Nkrumah called for the unification of Africa under a federal system and a single market that would lead to the rapid elimination of borders and tariffs. He expounded on his idea of developing an African personality in international affairs. To do this, Nkrumah wanted Africa to have a common foreign policy. Opponents of Nkrumah's plan in the Monrovia group, including Liberia's William Tubman and Cote d'Ivoire's Felix Houphouët Boni, said it would unduly benefit Ghana as one of the first independent states. Instead, they wanted a much looser confederal approach and were prepared to maintain strong economic ties with the former colonial masters. In the end, Ufwebonyi and Tubman won over 22 out of the 27 independent African states. Many of them francophone countries that had opted to stay within the Paris-backed currency zone. After Nkrumah's overthrow, Ufwebonyi was ready to call for French military aid against Guinea's threat to restore the Ghanaian leader by force. During the Nigerian Civil War, Bonny never opted for negotiations that he fervently preached. He persuaded the French president Charles de Gaulle to support Biafra under its leader, Lieutenant Kano Chuku Emeka Odemegu Ojuku. France supplied weapons and mercenaries which were controlled by Foucault, de Gaulle's eminence Greece in Africa. French supported nations suddenly and openly distanced themselves from France and Cote d'Ivoire's position on the Civil War. Isolated, both countries suspended their assistance to Ojuku, who eventually went into exile in Cote d'Ivoire. During the 1960 Congo crisis, the Ivorian leader supported President Joseph Kasavubu, an opponent of Lumumba, and followed France in supporting and defending the controversial Congolese Prime Minister, Moïse Chombe, who was disliked by much of Africa. Throughout his presidency, Oufoué Bonny maintained a close relationship with France in a policy known as France-Afrique, building a close friendship with Jacques Foucault, the chief advisor on African policy in De Gaulle and Pimpidou governments. Because of this overt association and flirtation with the imperialist France, many of the Pan-Africanist leaders saw Houphouët Bonny as an imperialist lackey and a sellout. In 1965, he created the OCAM, Africa and Malagasy Organization, to rival the OAU in order to break revolutionary ambitions in Africa. However, over the years, the organization became extremely subservient to France, resulting in the departure of the majority of its members, eventually leading to its collapse. His record with the OAU was mad with a big ego, poor attendance and threats to boycott summit meetings, as well as disregarding its decisions when they differed from his own. There is no doubt that Bonny's regime owes most of its longevity to the presence of French troops and French military assistants at all levels in the Ivorian ranks of the military. This was the soundest insurance against any successful coup. In 1971, French troops intervened to put down a rebellion by the Bete, an ethnic group traditionally opposed to the Baole, who fue Bonny's ethnic group. In 1990, faced with a combined civilian and military threat, the president again solicited French intervention. To avoid any coups, he further manipulated the military by reducing its size and created a militia royal to the party, consisting mostly of the Baole, his ethnic group. High-ranking officers were rewarded with high salaries compared to other civil servants. Where coups failed, his health and age could not. By 1980, the president was in his mid-70s and the question of his succession took on more importance. To solve this, he passed a constitutional amendment creating the office of the vice president. But competition among the rivals was so intense that the president found it was undignified and the empty office was abolished in 1985. A mass worldwide recession that began in 1980 overshadowed the important succession issue. Cocoa and coffee prices permitted between 1980 and 1983. Rising interest rates, escalating tensions in the labor force, violent and white-collar crime rose. The French community was the worst hit, whose numbers halved to 27,000 since 1980. In other cases, resentment against foreigners grew. The 180,000 strong Lebanese population of Abidjan lost their popularity with the government, receiving warnings about monopolistic business practices and customs fraud. Pressure mounted in 1986, when Bonny built the world's largest cathedral at Yamasukro, intended as his eventual tomb. The Basilica of Our Lady of Peace accommodated 300,000 worshippers, built on an area three times the size of Vatican City, at a cost of 300 million US dollars. Officially, the Basilica was a gift to the Catholic Church. After some initial hesitation, Pope John Paul II accepted it on condition that part of the grounds be used to feed and aid the country's poor, 
and also Cote d'Ivoire assumed its maintenance for 20 years at a cost of 3 million per year. Bonny was criticized for the construction as it contributed to the country's poverty and the debt of more than 10 billion US dollars in 1987. Furthermore, government wage freezes led to strikes everywhere. Social agitations shook the country, creating insecurity. The army mutinied in 1990. Protesters organized mass demonstrations in the streets of Abidjan, replacing slogans that once praised Bonny as a sage with slogans that demeaned him, such as Fif Hufwe, Corrupt Hufwe. In April 1990, he gave in, bringing an end to the 30 year domination of the Bonny and his PDCI RDA party. He opened the country up for multi-party politics, even allowing his most vocal critic, Professor Lolan Gbagbo, to return from exile and actively take part in the country's politics. In the first multi-party elections, Bonny won a seventh five-year term overwhelmingly in October 1990 at 85 years old. Bonny is remembered for his wealth as well, by enriching himself from the wealth of Côte d'Ivoire. By the time of his death in 1993, his personal wealth was estimated to be around 7 to 11 billion US dollars. He acquired a dozen properties all over Europe, in France, Switzerland, and Italy. He also owned real estate companies and had many shares in prestigious jewelry and watchmaking companies. And just like most African leaders, he stocked his wealth in Switzerland. When Bonny moved the capital from Abidjan to Yamasokro in 1983 at the expense of the state, he constructed a palace for himself in the new capital, built an artificial lake around it with crocodiles for protection. When his health became increasingly frail, the Prime Minister Alessana Kwatala administered the country from 1990 onwards, while the President was hospitalized in France. Suffering from prostate cancer, Bonny arranged for his life support systems to be turned off at dawn on December 7, 1993, the 33rd anniversary of independence from France. He was 88 years old when he passed on, and the longest serving African leader at the time. Two months later, he was laid to rest in a grandiose and lengthy funeral in the Basilica of Our Lady of Peace, with 7,000 guests inside the building and tens of thousands outside. The attendance was as lavish as the setting. Representatives from 80 countries, including 27 heads of states, were among the thousands of guests. The French, his closest allies, sent a delegation of 70 people in three passenger planes. Several Russian transport planes carried the 50 black limousines for the guests from France and motorcycles for the Republican Guard that would flank the motorway to the Basilica. The French delegation included every living former Prime Minister of France, led by the President Francois Mitterrand. To establish his legacy as a man of peace, Bonnier created an award in 1989 sponsored by UNESCO and funded entirely by the extra-budgetary resources provided by Felix Hufwe Bonny Foundation to honor those who search for peace. It is awarded annually along with a check of 122,000 euros by an international jury comprised of 11 persons from five continents, led by the former U.S. Secretary of State and Nobel Peace Prize winner, Henry Kissinger. Bonny's message of peace and social harmony is his most important legacy. Offering land to immigrants in exchange for labor on plantations, and ensuring that members of all ethnic groups were represented in positions of power. This fostered a culture of tolerance that persisted throughout his time. However, he did not endow his country with institutions needed to ensure stability after he died in 1993. His political party, as in all single-party governments, became ossified. Côte d'Ivoire faced dire straits derived from an undefined process of succession at the end of a reign that lasted too long. The institutional fragility set the stage for a military coup in December 1999, led by General Robert Gee. Elections in 2000 intended to legitimize Gee's rule were discredited when two leading candidates, including Alessana Kwatala, were disqualified over citizenship of their parents. Gee came in second in the elections, leading him to declare them invalid and himself the victor. Subsequent riots and attacks on the presidential palace forced him to flee. As the only major candidate whose name appeared on the ballot, Lolland Bagbo won the most votes and was declared president. Another coup attempt in 2002 precipitated an aggressive security operation against regions with large immigrant populations. This caused a wide displacement of people. The resulting polarization quickly evolved into a rebellion and a north-south split of the country. 
Bonnie was a great Ivorian, but a bad African, because of his foreign policy that was heavily influenced by the French. His idea of economic independence was indeed successful for as long as he was in power. But he could not predict its success in his absentia, and that's where Nkrumah was right. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share.